new Civic. Technologically advanced, aggressively styled. Forget the rest. Stellaris is a very complicated game and the learning curve here can be massive. There are over 40 different civics available to a regular biological empire. But which civics are really good to take and which civics should we completely ignore? Well, in this video, I'm going to try and break it down by using a tier list and let you know my thoughts on which are the best and worst civics available in Stellaris. Here we are at the very bottom of the pile. Welcome to the F tier. These civics are downright disastrous to take, or the benefit is simply so, so completely marginal that the opportunity cost of taking them is astronomical. Efficient bureaucracy is the first civic in this tier. You're going to get minus 20% administrator upkeep. And that is about it. You're not going to get anything else for this Civic. Yes, as the game goes on, you will get more administrators, so you will slave slightly more on your consumer goods, but overall, it's really not that useful. You're gonna be generating a lot of unity, not just through your administrators, but through your politician classes, as well as in some other ways. I'm looking at the soldier jobs, all sorts of different things. So efficient bureaucracy, it could sneak into the seat here, but from my point of view, it's just such a niche benefit that it's really never, never worth taking. Philosopher King increases the ruler level cap by two. Also, rulers and governors can't gain negative traits when they level up. Now, basically, you're probably never going to find this plus two ruler level cap useful at any point in the game. Your ruler will almost certainly be chasing the level cap and your technologies, traditions and policies will be pushing your leader level cap up to the point where you will probably get to max level 10 before you ever benefit from this plus two. The other part of this trait, not gaining negative traits, well, they reworked one of the worst negative traits that used to give you minus 1000% uh, XP gain. That now just gives you minus two level cap. So the negative traits really aren't as bad as they used to be. Warrior Culture increases your army damage by 20%. It replaces entertainer jobs with duelist jobs. The first part of this, increasing army damage by 20%, is nice, but really not very necessary. Armies and ground combat, as you might know, isn't the main focus of Stellaris. The second part of this, the duelist jobs, well, that is very similar to Entertainer, except it requires alloys as upkeep. That means the more amenities you need across your world, the more alloy upkeep your population will need. And that is really, really bad. You want to be spending your alloys on your ships and ship maintenance. You don't want to have to spend extra alloys on your population. That's why Warrior Culture is all the way down here in the F tier. Idyllic Bloom allows you to construct and upgrade Gaia Cedar buildings. It also cannot be added or removed after the start of the game. I'm going to preface this by saying that there is a rework coming to Gaia Cedar, and that will probably move it up ever so slightly. But at present, in order to turn a world into a Gaia world, you first have to convert it into your primary planetary preference, so you probably have to do a lot of terraforming. And later on in the game, as you unlock habitability technologies, you're probably already going to be at 100% habitability when you convert a planet into a Gaia world. So the only benefits you're getting is the plus 10% happiness and plus 10% resources from jobs, which is good. But all of the hoops you have to jump through to get here and the fact that you are losing out on a civic slot and can never replace it really does keep this down in the F tier. With the new changes, I expect to move this up to either C, possibly even B tier, because as you unlock new technology options for terraforming, you'll be able to construct Gaia Cedar buildings on less and less hospitable worlds, and that is going to make it much, much better. If you can go directly from a tomb world or simply a world with the complete wrong climate preference straight into a Gaia world, that could be very, very powerful around the mid game. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Merchant guilds, once firmly in the A tier, possibly even in the S tier, because of the combination of allowing merchants to get extra unity and getting a merchant spam build going, well, gone are those days. Merchant guilds is now firmly down in the F tier. Even if you're going for a trade value build, you really don't need this civic in order to go full trade value. With the mercantile 
tradition, you can get access to merchants already through that, getting merchants through the commercial zone. It is really a completely unnecessary pick. I mean, it could sit in the C tier, but I'm so upset with how bad it is now that from my point of view, it's right down in the F tier. I will never, ever take it. Anglers causes your main species to gain the aquatic trait, so you must have your primary worlds set to ocean worlds, and aquatic is a very good trait, don't get me wrong. You also have no agriculture district limit on ocean worlds. However, agriculture districts and hydroponics farms replace their farmer jobs with a single angler job on wet climate worlds, and agriculture districts create a single pearl diver job on wet climates as well. Together, they produce a net of six food, three consumer goods, and five trade value. They also have an upkeep of two minerals. Now, why is this so terrible? because yes, the anglers are more efficient than the farmers. They are producing an extra two food for a total of eight base food, but two of that food is used up immediately by the pearl divers and the pop efficiency in order to produce consumer goods using your pearl divers is very, very low. Each pearl diver will have a base output of consumer goods, half that of a regular artisan specialist. And because you can only have one angler per food district now, that means you will need double the number of food districts in order to provide the same amount of food as you previously needed. And from my point of view, you want to be minimizing the number of food workers and also the number of agriculture districts. It is the worst resource to have an excess of as there is simply no point to it other than selling it for more energy. And to top all of that off, you can't even get rid of the Angler's Civic if you take it at the start of the game. And if you're enjoying this video, please, civilize that like button. We've made it to the C tier. The C tier is a step up from the F tier, but only slightly. Some of these civics are still pretty rubbish when you compare them to other better civics you could take. And so filling up your civic slots with these is probably not a brilliant idea. However, there are some great role playing civics amongst these. So let's dive in and find out what we've got. Starting us off, we have environmentalist, minus 20% pop consumer goods upkeep. Now, this is bad, just like efficient bureaucracy, because, well, you're not really going to be worried too much about the consumer goods upkeep of your individual pops. I mean, unless you're running something like Utopian Abundance and every pop has a one consumer good upkeep, then this could be rather useful. But at the start of the game, it's really completely irrelevant. In the mid game, it might be slightly relevant. And in the late game, when you've got hundreds and hundreds of pops, yes, it's much more relevant, but minus 20% here to your consumer good upkeep, it's still not that big a deal. That's why I've placed it here in the C tier. Agrarian Idyll gives you plus one housing from generator, mining, and agriculture districts, minus one housing from city districts, plus two amenities from farmers, and an additional building slot for every four agriculture districts. You also cannot pick the Arcology Project Ascension perk, and you must be some form of pacifist. Basically, this isn't so great because you're going to need city districts in order to get building slots. If you go heavy for the agriculture districts and end up with a glut of them, and therefore you've got pops working those farmer jobs and end up with a glut of food, well, you really can't do anything with that food other than inefficiently converting it into energy via the market. On top of that, you can't pick the Arcology project, which would enable you to build an Ecumenopolis world, which is basically the best world you can have your biological pops on. So the fact that it limits you from taking some of the best options and also forces you down some rather hazardous routes is why it's firmly in the C tier. The Corvée system gives you plus 15% growth from immigration and no unity costs for pop resettlement. You cannot be egalitarian and you can't have free haven. As I mentioned before, that pop growth from immigration modifier is going to be pretty irrelevant to your civilization, especially after the early game. The reduction or complete abolishment of unity costs from pop resettlement is nice, but it is so cheap in terms of unity to resettle your pops. Only 10 unity for worker class pops means that once you're uh, a few dozens of years into the game around year 20 or 30, and you're making anywhere in excess of one to 200 unity per month, 10 unity to resettle a pop is pretty irrelevant. 
Feudal society gives plus one unity per governor level, minus 50% subject relative power opinion penalty, minus 50% leader cost, leaders have no upkeep, subjects can construct star bases, and you are unable to dismiss your leaders. You'll have to be imperial to get this as well. Now, it is important to note this is going to get a rework with Stellaris Overlords, and it's possible it could find its way all the way up in the A tier, what with the changes to Vassals and the changes to the Civic. But at present, it's really not worth it. Yes, having minus 50% leader cost and extra unity per governor level is nice, but not being able to dismiss leaders is somewhat of a pain, and really this is mainly there for RP related purposes at present. Do put a pin in it though because I think it will be getting really, really good with the new Overlord DLC. Nationalistic Zeal gives you minus 20% war exhaustion gain and minus 15% claim influence cost. At the moment, that claim influence cost reduction is pretty useless. Around the mid game, you're going to find yourself with so much influence you really don't know what to do with it. And getting a 15% reduction to claims is only very good if you are maxing out your claim reductions and going for zero influence claims. The minus 20% war exhaustion gain is slightly better because that will keep you in the fight for longer and mean you can wear down some grueling opponents with guerrilla warfare. However, it still doesn't outweigh the basic rubbishness of this perk at present. Parliamentary system gives you plus 40% unity output from your factions. Factions have been reworked in 3.3, they now give it unity instead of influence. And in the mid to late game when you have lots and lots of pops, that can be quite a lot of unity, especially if you're keeping your factions happy. So this civic does get better over time, but your primary method of unity gain will never be your factions unless you're really not making unity in any other way, and therefore it does sit down here in the C tier, though probably somewhere near the top of the C tier. Shadow Council gives you minus 75% election influence cost, plus 10% ruler pop resource output, and plus one code breaking. The reduction to election influence cost is okay, but now that that is a unity cost, it's really nothing to get too excited about. Additionally, the plus 10% to ruler pop resource output, as it's only resources, will mainly be a small increase to their unity production, and if you've got something like technocracy, maybe a bit of extra science, but overall, nothing amazing. The code breaking's fine, but again, nothing amazing, and that's why it is down here in the C tier. Catalytic processing replaces metallurgist jobs with catalytic technician jobs. They convert nine food into three alloys, as opposed to six minerals into three alloys. Basically, that isn't very good. Why is that not good? Well, you're going to have to build up a lot of agriculture districts and an agriculture-based economy. Why is that bad? Well, having excess food is completely useless. On the other hand, having excess minerals is essential in order to be able to build more buildings and improve the civilization you are playing as. Yes, it can be reasonable to have catalytic processing paired with something like agrarian idle, but it's not the best thing going and it will, if anything, limit you for no overall benefit. This is definitely an opportunity cost of a civic. Pleasure Seekers allows you to use the decadent lifestyle living standard. That basically gives you plus 20% happiness to all your pops. The Civic also gives plus 1% pop growth speed from entertainers and plus 5 amenities from servants rather than the regular plus 4. This used to be much, much, much better. It used to be A tier, if not possibly S tier. However, they have changed the upkeep costs of the different living standards. The ruler class now for Decadent Lifestyle costs 1.5 consumer goods as opposed to the previous, which was just 1.1. That now means if you take this one, that you take Pleasure Seekers, you will almost certainly start the game with negative consumer good production, and it's only going to get worse from there. There. But what do you think of this tier list so far? You might disagree with some of the things I've said here, please let me know down in the comments below. I will be checking the comments for basically everything if there's something you want to say in the first few hours after this video goes live. And I will endeavour to respond to as many as I can. 
In the B tier, we have civics that are almost certainly a benefit to your society. There are very rarely downsides to taking these civics. However, they are simply not the best civics available unless you're in some very specific and very niche circumstances or you're trying to do something very specific within the game. Anyway, let's dive in and find out what's in the B tier. With the Unity rework, Cutthroat Politics is now much, much better. It gives you minus 20% edict cost and minus 20% edict upkeep, along with plus one code breaking. In the very early game, yes, this won't be relevant, but from the early game to the mid game and somewhat beyond that, this is going to be very, very useful as your edict cost and edict upkeep is very much tied to the empire size of your empire. So as your empire size goes up, you'll be getting more and more benefit from this. And if you pair it with something like Fanatic Spiritualist, you can be looking at a minus 40% edict cost and edict upkeep, which is definitely not something to sniff at. That means much further into game than you would normally be uh, able to, you'll be able to keep those edicts running without suffering too much negatives in terms of your Unity production. Functional architecture gives you minus 15% building and district cost as well as plus one building slots. This used to be an auto include civic for most empires. That was when it had plus two building slots. However, using a specific ethic along with a civic combo, you can replicate the plus one building slot advantage right at the start of the game, and therefore functional architecture is reduced only to a minus 15% building and district cost. Along with that, as the game goes on, you're going to find the plus one building slot less and less relevant for your empire. That's why it now sits down here in the B tier. Mining Guilds is nice and simple. It gives you plus one minerals from miners. This is nice, this is a good bonus, especially because it is a base increase, so it will benefit from all of the extra plus 20%, plus 10%, all of that kind of stuff, the extra bonuses and modifiers you'll get as the game goes on. However, it's really not that amazing, it's just plus one minerals from miners. You may be surprised to see Aristocratic Elite all the way up here at the B tier in this tier list. What does it do at the moment? Well, it gives you plus one governor level cap and allows you to construct noble estate buildings. These give you noble jobs. And additionally, at your capital buildings, some of your politician jobs are replaced with nobles. Well, basically, the reason this is now in the B tier is that with the Unity rework, the noble jobs have changed. It is now identical to the politician job, granting three amenities and six unity. But on top of that, it also gives you plus two stability, which is equivalent to plus 1.2% production from jobs, as well as bonuses to trade value. This means that at the maximum level with Aristocratic Elite, you can get an extra six stability on your most developed world. That is nothing to sniff at. Idealistic Foundation gives you plus 10% happiness to all pops across all worlds. You must be a Galactarian to take this, and basically that additional happiness will convert to plus 6 stability. So as you can see, it is very similar, though you don't need to jump through the extra hoop of building one additional building as the previous Civic Aristocratic Elite. Police State gives you plus five stability and plus one unity from enforcers and telepaths. In essence, this is an ever so slightly worse version of Idealistic Foundation, but it is still quite good. Plus five stability is pretty nice. Pompous Purus is a bit of a weird civic. It gives you plus 30% trust growth, plus two available envoys, and you can send but cannot receive diplomatic propositions. You must be xenophobe to take this, and basically it works in a very strange way. It means that if you meet an enemy civilization, sorry, I slipped up there, that was a Freudian slip. If you meet an alien civilization and they have not set their diplomatic policy, their border policy to close automatically, unless they declare you a rival, they cannot close their borders to you. That can be very, very annoying for those aliens. It is also quite nice from a quality of life perspective because it means you will not constantly be bombarded with alien propositions. And I also like the extra available envoys. Barbaric despoilers cannot be added or removed after the game has started. It allows you to use the despoilation cases belly 
along with the raiding orbital bombardment stance. You cannot form migration treaties and you can only create martial alliances and hegemony federations. The main reason this civic is any good is that the raiding orbital bombardment stance allows you to steal pops from other empires. That means later on in the game when you're having some pop growth issues due to the fact you have a large number of pops in your empire and thus your pop production will be down because you need to get more growth points to get a new pop if you have more pops in your empire. That allows you to sidestep all of that nonsense, simply go straight to the source and uh, grab some <clears throat> new friends from neighboring empires. Byzantine bureaucracy gives you plus one unity from bureaucrats and plus one stability from bureaucrats. Generally speaking, bureaucrats are a much worse version of priests, they don't provide any additional amenities. But by taking this, you will enable your bureaucrats to add extra stability, which is much better, plus one stability, much better than plus two amenities. And that means as long as you put a few bureaucrats on some of your worlds, you're gonna get somewhere in the region of six to 10 extra stability from this in the mid to late game. This is not so good at the beginning of the game when you have very few bureaucrats, but later on, if you jump through the right hoops, because you will need more bureaucrats for more unity later on, this will give you extra stability, so it's quite a nice bonus. Diplomatic Core is quite a nice perk if you're trying to align the galactic community to your will. Plus two available envoys and plus 10% diplomatic weight. The diplomatic weight is fine, but the envoys here are the best part. These are going to allow you to either send them into the galactic community, send them into your federation to boost XP, or possibly use them as spies, though I really wouldn't recommend doing that. Overall, this is definitely one of the weaker civics here in the B tier, though it is a personal favourite of mine, and that's why I put it up here. Memorialists allows you to build the Sanctuary of Repose line of buildings. These replace monuments. They give the same basic bonuses as monuments, plus one, plus two, or plus three unity per ascension perk, as well as plus five percent unity from jobs. On top of that, they give you access to Death Chroniclers. Death Chroniclers increase your stability by two, your amenities by two, give you two society research, and two unity. Plus one unity with Byzantine bureaucracy as well. At the maximum level, you can get six of these Death Chroniclers, and that will give you a nice juicy plus 12 stability, but it does come rather late in the day. And as a job, well, it's really not that good. It's very much an all-rounder job, giving you a little bit of everything. And if you're enjoying this video and other videos on this channel, you can help to support this channel by either becoming a channel member, supporting this channel through Patreon, or purchasing something on the Humble Bundle store. Links to all of these are down in the description below. Until April the 12th, you can get EU4, another Paradox Grand Strategy game, for as little as one euro, or you can get the game along with all of the DLC for under 20 euros on the Humble Bundle store until April the 12th. Thank you for sticking with me. We've now made it all the way up to the A tier. Now, these civics are very good in their own right. You will almost certainly have something from this tier or you might want something from this tier in your empire. There are only a select number of civics that are better than these, but I will say that most empires I have have at least one civic from this tier. Beacon of Liberty gives you plus 15% monthly unity and reduces the empire size from pops by 15%. If you combine this with other sources of pop empire size reduction, you can end up as much as minus 75% reduction to your empire size from pops. So Beacon of Liberty is very, very good in the mid to late game. Additionally, it's one of the few ways to get an increase or bonus to your unity production before you're getting to repeatables. And therefore it sits comfortably here in the A tier. Citizen Service gives you plus two unity from soldier jobs, plus 15% naval capacity, and full citizenship pops must have full military service and vice versa. Never forget, service guarantees citizenship. 
Producing unity from soldiers is very, very good in the mid to late game. Additionally, that naval capacity bonus is really, really good in the mid to late game. At the beginning, 15% won't seem like much, but when you get up to 1,000 or 1,500 naval capacity, an extra 150 to 200 is a whole additional fleet. Distinguished Admiralty has had a bit of a buff with 3.3. You get plus one to your Admiral level cap, plus 10% ship fire rate, and plus 10 fleet command limit. Additionally, all Admirals and Generals get plus two to their starting level, meaning they will all start on level three. That is very, very nice. If you have Militarist and you are going on the aggressive, Distinguished Admiralty is a very, very, very good Civic to take. Exalted Priesthood is now a unity making machine with the 3.3 update. You will get plus one unity from all of your priests, meaning that you must be some form of spiritualist to take this, and capital buildings replace some politician jobs with high priest jobs. High priests have had a bit of a change with 3.3. Now they produce more amenities than a regular politician producing five amenities and with Exalted Priesthood, seven unity. Priests with this will also be producing five unity base. So if you take Exalted Priesthood, unity will never be a problem for your empire. And you also will probably never need to go beyond your politician, high priest and priest jobs for your amenities production. And that is very powerful. You're getting a good saving on your pop efficiency there. Imperial Cult gives plus 100 Edict Fund. Right at the start of the game, this isn't very useful because you don't have many Edicts. But within the first 10 to 15 years, this is very, very good. However, it will become worse over time as your Empire size increases and thus the cost of your Edicts goes up too. But in the first 30, 40, 50 years, Imperial Cult is a really, really good Civic. I really do recommend it if you are the Imperial Empire Authority. Inward Perfectionist cannot be removed or added after the game has started, unless you go down the Psionic Ascension path and do some funny tricky things. It will give you plus 20% monthly unity, plus 10% pop growth speed, plus 5% happiness, plus 50 edict fund, plus one encryption, minus one code breaking, minus one available envoys. Additionally, your diplomatic negotiations and diplomatic treaties are vastly restricted and you cannot infiltrate pre-FTL civilizations. This is a massive set of bonuses for a single civic and that's because the diplomatic restrictions are very uh, hamstringing if you are really, really into and need to get diplomatic agreements with your neighbors. If you don't need to do that and you don't want to go on the aggressive, you don't want to be conquering anyone, then Inward Perfectionist isn't really all that bad. The unity and pop growth bonuses really make it worth it. And that's before we even look at the happiness and edict fund increase. Overall, Inward Perfectionist is really, really good, though from my point of view, it doesn't quite make it to S tier because it is a limiting factor on playstyle and thus slightly unpleasant. Slaver Guilds gives you plus 10% slave pop resource output and enforces a 35% in slave pop ratio. You must be authoritarian and you cannot be pleasure seekers. Now, slaves have seen better times. Slaves will no longer get any bonuses to production if they are working specialist class jobs and you will almost certainly want to have indentured servitude set as your slave rights if you take slaver guilds. However, that being said, it does reduce your consumer good upkeep quite dramatically across your empire, so that is rather nice. Though, personally, I don't often take this anymore. It can be a little fiddly in the mid to late game. But if you're running a definite slave build for your empire, this can be a no-brainer. Shared Burdens allows you to use the Shared Burden Living Standard for your pops. That is basically a communist living standard, giving you identical upkeep for all strata of your workforce from rulers down to workers, identical happiness bonuses, and identical trade value generation. 
you also get plus five stability, minus 40% pop demotion time, and your housing buildings are replaced with communal housing and utopian communal housing, which compared to the luxury housing buildings, in essence, swap around the housing added and the amenities added. So it now adds five housing and three amenities rather than the other way around. With this living standard, as long as you have a high number of specialists and rulers relative to workers, will be a dramatic saving on your consumer goods upkeep. You'll also get some nice trade value, though it's not as good as something like social welfare or utopian abundance. But when we combine that with the additional five stability and somewhat better housing buildings, it is quite a nice civic to take. Reanimators allows you to replace military academy buildings with dread encampments. Additionally, there is a 33% chance to gain an undead army after you defeat an enemy army. That is only organic armies as well. I need to note if you attack them with robots, those robots won't come back to life as the undead. Additionally, defeated organic leviathans and guardians like the Ether Drake can be resurrected with this civic. Basically, the Dread Encampment is alright, it gives you some extra research, but the main strength here is the Undead Army and that chance to reinforce your own army with Undead Armies when you defeat an enemy army. If you fill up your worlds with Undead Armies and the enemy is coming with regular Assault Armies or Clone Armies and they haven't massively increased their disengagement chance, they will find it nigh on impossible to actually take your worlds in ground combat. They'll be forced to either crack the planet it or bombard it from orbit forever. This means that reanimators makes your civilization massively, and I really do mean massively, defensible. Death cults allow you to construct sacrifice buildings and make use of these sacrificed edicts. The Sacrifice Edicts are very, very powerful. By killing the mortal initiates in your sacrificial temples, you can get either a happiness bonus from 10% to 50%, a monthly unity bonus from 10% to 35% and or a boost to monthly energy credits and monthly minerals from plus 5% at the minimum to plus 30% at the maximum. Additionally, whilst a sacrificed edict is active, the death priests will get double the unity production. This means that in the early game, death cults can be very, very powerful for giving your civilization a head up, a step up, a leg up above your competition, your neighbors and your rivals. But it is essential that you use that advantage to go and conquer other civilizations and other space for a glut of pops for the mortal initiate job. As, as your empire size and your empire increases, you'll have to sacrifice more pops and the mortal initiates in order to get the same bonuses you were enjoying before. But if you can play it just right, you'll end up with some phenomenal pop efficiencies by sacrificing some of the less wanted elements of your population. The S tier represents the best civics available to any civilization in Stellaris. You will almost certainly want to take at least one of these, possibly two, Though really, sometimes you might end up with all three of your civics coming from this S tier. But what have we got in the S tier? Well, let's dive in and take a look. First up, we have Meritocracy. This gives you plus one leader level cap, and importantly, plus 10% specialist pop resource output. That additional specialist pop resource output is going to help your metallurgists, your researchers, your unity production, basically all of the important second level role jobs you have in your empire. And for that reason, it is an auto include whenever you have the ability to take it. It is never bad to have meritocracy. Technocracy has had a bit of a change with 3.3. It now gives you plus one research alternatives. The expertise traits of your scientists have double the effect on tech choices and your capital buildings will replace some politician jobs with science director jobs. In 3.3, this is now much, much better. In the early game, plus one research alternatives is crucial in order to tech beeline for the specific alloy building techs and other techs you'll need to get ahead of the other empires around you. The effect of the expertise traits doubling the effect on tech choices is very nice, though not essential. 
And with 3.3, science director jobs have got much better. They now produce equivalent amenities to a regular politician job, only one third of the unity at plus two unity, but a whopping plus six to all research output fields for a total of plus 18 base research output. Additionally, when you've got this, you'll probably be running the academic privilege civic, which is going to further increase that research output and further increase their happiness and thus the stability on your planets. Technocracy, in my opinion, is way up there in the S tier, though I could hear some arguments as to why it may be down in the A tier, but at the top of the A tier, however, personal preference, S tier. Fanatic Purifiers is a very powerful civic, but for some players, it can reduce the enjoyment and options available to them in the game. You cannot remove this or add it after the game has started. Additionally, you will get a whopping plus 33% fire rate, plus 33% army damage, minus 15% ship cost, and plus 33% naval capacity. On top of that, you are a genocidal species, which has a whole host of other issues arranged with it. You will have to purge all of the aliens you find, and that means the only pop growth you're going to be getting is internal pop growth from your empire. But the military benefits of this trait so vastly outweigh that, you're going to be one step ahead of all of your neighbors, and because you have to take fanatic xenophobe, you're going to be at a base of plus 20% pop growth, whatever happens. Masterful Crafters gives you the initial advantages of one of the other civics while having some fantastic far-reaching advantages later into the game. What does it do? It replaces artisan jobs with artificer jobs. That gives you plus one consumer goods, plus two trade value, and plus 1.1 engineering research per artificer, what used to be called artisans, your consumer good producing jobs. And for every three industrial districts, you will gain one building slot except on habitats. Now, when you combine this with the civic like spiritualist, you'll start the game with three industrial districts and then you will get an additional building slot as if you'd taken functional architecture. On top of that, as consumer goods can't really be used for anything except that one decision to distribute luxury amenities or luxury goods later on in the game, you're not really going to want a massive glut and a massive excess of these, so you will want to have increased pop efficiency and reduce the number of consumer good producing jobs in your empire, and therefore artificers are very useful for increasing the rate of consumer good output. On top of that, because you're getting plus one consumer goods base, you can quite comfortably switch to a militarized economy and eat that minus 25% consumer good output from artificers in exchange for a whopping 25% bonus to metallurgist output. So in some ways you could look at this plus one consumer goods really as a minus one consumer goods, but then plus 25% alloy output. And that is absolutely phenomenal. That is why in my opinion, Opinion, Masterful Crafters is currently the best civic in the game for biological empires. If you'd like to know more about machine intelligence civics, which ones are worth taking and which ones are absolute garbage, click the video on screen now.